Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM offered an update on the state of the electricity system this week. Terence Creamer joins me now to talk about the highlights. Hi Terence. Hi Sam. Um, with winter almost over and the high maintenance summer season approaching, is the return of load shedding on the cards? I think happily not. I think we've entered a stage now where the, there's a return to stability in terms of the operation of the uh, Eskom coal-fired fleet. Now, if we go back a number of years, but where we saw towards the end of 2014, the, the, the cabinet set up that war room to look at uh, why we weren't able to keep the lights on post the coal silo collapse, and there was also the Duva Unit 3 explosion. And it really came down to this continual slippage in um, the energy availability factor from Eskom's coal-fired fleet, and that uh, you know the knock-on effect in terms of high unplanned outages, really, that we're, we're soaring. And uh, what we've seen over the last year, I think, is a consistent improvement in the uh, management of the fleet in terms of getting a higher energy availability factor. So, over the period April to June, which is the the, the winter period last year, we had an energy availability factor below 70%. For the same period this year, we had an energy availability factor of closer of around 79%. So a much, much improved performance. It's not yet at the target of 80%, which was set by the Cabinet War Room, which is now defunct, which has been closed down. But we want an 80% energy availability factor. And in fact, if we look back in history, I think if we had ever, if we had retained an energy availability factor of above 80%, we would never ever had any load shedding in the system because there is enough capacity built in South Africa. The additional capacity that we were building was in anticipation of far higher demand. Now, we know that that hasn't materialized. In fact, demand has fallen and we're down at sort of 2011 type levels because we've had a very slow economic growth. Plus, because of the electricity crisis and the load shedding, people have pulled in their horns on investment and energy intensive users have changed their consumption patterns or they've been forced to curtail. Uh, there's been mandatory curtailment. So we've moved into a, a different uh, era, I think, now, hopefully. The issue now is whether it will be sustained go, uh, going into the future. Now we're into the, the summer months. Now, if you look back traditionally as well, that's when we really see load shedding. We don't usually traditionally see, except for maybe 2014, much load shedding in the, uh, in the, in the winter months because generally we do the maintenance in the summer and the profile of electricity demand means there's not much margin for error between day and night during the peaks. So it's, that's when we've used to, we're used to seeing load shedding. But I think there's a, there's a quiet confidence that I think that the load shedding era is now something in the past. And how does ESCOM explain the high level of disruptions this winter? Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> on the one hand, we've had no rotational cuts from, say, the control central control center where they've been phoning municipalities or energy intensive users and saying you have to switch off or otherwise we risk, uh, run the risk of a blackout. So that's what uh, load shedding is. And we haven't really seen any of that mechanical switching off during uh, the last, well, 11 months really, except for two hours. And uh, what we've seen is a lot of disruption at the, the localized level, at the muni at the, uh, especially in a number of the, what would be formerly called, called township areas. There's been a lot of disruption. And we've also seen a lot of service delivery protests that have arisen around electricity during this winter period. And I think Eskom's gone to some lengths to explain how they understand what's happening. And they put up some interesting uh, pictures, which I think we've all often seen through Twitter accounts. But now they are, as Eskom formally putting these out, um, on these spaghetti junctions that have emerged in around uh, township areas, as well as informal settlements where there's a lot of illegal connections taking place. This is leading to quite a lot of overloading of the system. This is leading to uh, failures in that localized area and taking down, um, taking down substa mini substations. And uh, it's been quite a disrupted period. And uh, obviously as temperatures fall, people want that heat and that light and uh, there's this, uh, you know, also it's darker for longer. So there, there's this, more, this higher temptation to tap in illegally. So there's a big focus on the distribution end, both from the municipalities and from Eskom to try and sort this out. Now this is a much, I mean, we know how difficult it was to get the energy availability factor up at the general, the supply side. 
the demand side is, is, is um, the distribution end is much more disaggregated, much more scattered, and much more difficult to contain. There's a lot of potentially hands in the system. Um, and so we're seeing a, a lot of these failures at the moment, and very dangerous as well for uh, individuals. In fact, Eskim's put out a very graphic and I think quite disturbing, almost overly graphic uh, television advert which shows the, the consequences of an individual uh, tapping in illegally and the burning of that person as a result. And it really is quite a disturbing video. So there's this campaign that's being launched. There's also, I think, a much high level of uh, cooperation around specific hotspots. It seems like Ha Teng is particularly a, a hotspot <coughs> in a number of the township areas in there. So there's a lot of attention going in with the different distributors, municipal distributors in Ha Teng, whether that's in Akureleni or uh, in Chwane or City Power in Johannesburg. There's, there's this cooperation and there's a fixing up of um, these mini subs on all these um, different things that have been failing. But on the other hand, it's not an easy uh, battle to, to win. And I think it's going to be some time. I think if we thought the generation problems were difficult to fix, this is going to be an even more, uh, up more <laughs> difficult and uphill battle over the next few years. Also, there's a, there's a culture of non-payment that also is associated with this. And I think, um, I think the, that the shift in focus is important. There's high level attention being given to it at Eskom. And this cooperative approach is very uh, useful as well, but it's not going to be a, an easy uh, battle to win. What does a higher level of plant availability mean, and is this sustainable? I think that is the big question, as I alluded to in the uh, the, the first qu uh, the, the initially, um, the sustainability of this energy availability factor. It's been a, a remarkable recovery. I mean, what we've seen, one of the big uh, uh, outcomes immediately as we've seen this drop in the use of the open cycle gas turbines, those very unpopular power stations down in the Western Cape, which probably saved us from a lot more load shedding. But, you know, we burnt a lot of diesel over the last few years. Uh, you know, running it was running at about a billion rand a month. In fact, uh, period on period, which is the quarter that I spoke about, that April to June, there was about 3.1, nearly 4 billion spent last year on diesel. That's dropped massively to about 83 million. You know, so it's, we're in a different ballpark in terms of using the open cycle gas. So that's the immediate benefits of this. Now, if it's sustained, uh, the, it changes dynamics massively, especially because we've got a, a very different demand profile to what was initially forecast in, say, for instance, the integrated resource plan of 2010. There was this view that we were going to be growing as an economy at a, around 5%, 4%, 5%, and therefore electricity demand was going to be growing at 2.5%, 3% a year. And that's just not materialising. We've actually shrunk as a, as a country in terms of electricity use. So if you've got this high energy availability factor, it immediately means that you've got surplus uh, capacity because you've got this lower demand. So Eskim's actually going to be actively probably seeking new markets, ironically, for the surplus power. And of the, 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 natural, uh, the natural place to look immediately is into the region where there are uh, power deficits across the region. The, the problem there and the constraint is whether there's uh, um, transmission infrastructure to evacuate the power from South Africa into the region. But there is this pent up demand and in some places it's, it got quite acute because of the drought because there's a lot of reliance on hydroelectricity for instance in Zambia and Zimbabwe. Hopefully, the, hopefully we won't see those same drought conditions in the summer season coming forward but there's still this massive demand so that would be uh, the off obvious uh, market if it's sustained. And I think uh, the other thing is that we've got a build program that's adding a lot of, uh, I mean, these are two monster plants that we're building in the form of Concilia and Madupi, 4,800 megawatts each. You know, that's a lot of capacity, plus we've got Angula coming uh, come on stream. We've only got one of those Madupi units in. We have a RPP program on the renewables front. We have a potential for a gas to power program on the uh, RPP front. And then obviously you've got the, the longer term plan around pos possibly introducing nuclear. So I think we need some better visibility uh, as South Africa. One, I think there might be need to audit uh, or independently assess the sustainability of this e energy availability factor from Eskom. I think independence is important because we want to know, you know, have they taken shortcuts here to get to this or have they really made fundamental changes? Because if it's fundamental, it does change a lot on the supply side 
uh, going into the future because we don't need as much capacity being built immediately. The pace uh, can be decelerated. We will need new capacity over time because we've got a, a very mature coal fleet and eventually that coal fleet either needs to be retired or it might not produce at its name rated nameplate. So we will need new additional investment, but the pace might change. So we, and then the other thing we really desperately need uh, now is some really uh, a visibility on what is the integrated resource plan with a proper demand, uh, scenario, demand projection scenario. Or you can never have a perfect one, but with more realistic um, demand outlook in that so that we can, we can align our generation investments, both public through the ESKIM and the private ones that are coming um, to a, a plan that's much more um, realistic. And I think that the ball really is in the Department of Energy's court to try and get, uh, give that visibility to the market. Because I think uh, if we, we, you know, if we continue as if it's just the same as it was where we were in a deficit position, it's, it could be quite difficult for uh, private power producers, for instance, in the future if um, you build, a, say, a peaking power plant and it doesn't get used already, we're seeing that with the two private power peaking power plants that are both diesel fueled. We're not using them like we thought we would. You know, it's quite a, a it changes the game quite considerably. On the other hand, you know, do we need to put, accelerate or decelerate the pace of gas to power or uh, renewables? And how do we approach nuclear? Surely there's a lot more breathing space to do that properly. But you know, we need to have a new marker. <laughs> we just don't have that at the moment. So everyone still refers to the 2010 RP, which is really out of date. And it's now becoming past urgent to get that sorted out. Thank you, Terence. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.